Did you ever stop and wonder if you could be related to everyone with your last name? Just think if you're a Lincoln, how you'd be congratulated if Honest Abe were someone you could claim. To clear up any mystery, just check your family history. Genealogy's the name of the game. Now some ancestors you'll find you want to hide. But most of them will fill your heart with pride. Oh, your family tree, your family tree. Your your family family tree. tree. Check your, your genealogy, find who was who and how who came to be. On your family, 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 family tree. Welcome to the Genealogy Radio Show, the radio show that's keeping you in the loop. And this week's show, we have a fascinating show on Ned Kelly. We're looking at the famous outlaw in Australian history and legacy and his Irish ancestral connections, place and space. Now, Kelly is a very old Irish surname and it comes from O'Kelly and it means bright headed. Its origin of place is in Eve Mania in County Galway. And we also have his grandmother, Ned Kelly's grandmother, being Mary Cody in Killinall in County Tipperary, and Clon Brogan as well, being a Cody or a Mock Oida, which comes from the 13th century archdeacon name, so would have had an ecclesiastical connection. Wonderful legacies there. Now, welcome, Chloe. You're going to tell us a little bit about the Irish roots and the lands and what happened to make sure that Ned ended up being born in Australia. Thanks, Lorna. So Edward Ned Kelly was born in British colony of Victoria as the third of eight children and the first born son to Irish immigrant parents. But how did his family even end up in Australia in the first place? His father, a transporter convict nicknamed Red, who would later die shortly after serving a six month prison sentence when Kelly was 12 years old, was originally from Clong Rogan in County Tipperary, born to Thomas and Mary Nee Cody Kelly in February of 1820. Thomas Kelly could be seen in the Tide Apartments from 1830, living in Clong Rogan on land measuring four acres, three rods, one perch, which is approximately one acre and two and a fifth rods of the whole land of Clonbrogan, which would have costed him five shillings and six pence to own. In December of 1840, John was arrested for stealing two pigs near Cashel and later selling them in care. The next month, John was found guilty of this crime and would be sentenced to seven years transportation in Australian Van Diemen land, which is now known as, as Australia's island, Tasmania. Now, Combrogan, Thomas Kelly's home place, was a small town within County Tipperary. His Irish name is Clua Brogan, which would be roughly translated to Brogan's Meadow, with the first word Clua be meaning meadow and Brogan being an Irish name. There is a great valuation for the region for Thomas Kelly, who we assume is Ned Kelly's grandfather. Combrogan resides in the civil parish of in the parish of Killinall and resides one mile west of Moyglass village where Thomas Kelly would be, was baptized and would later marry his wife, Ned's grandmother. From the, for the 18, 1988 Australian Bicentenary, the Federal Historical Society managed to trace back Ned Kelly's grand roots to Glambrogan. The Glambrogan townland is the 23,308th largest town that we know of about. And within County Tipperary, it's the 1,238th largest town. Land. Now, Killinall is a small civil parish within County Tipperary with a declining population. In Samuel Lewis's Topographical Dictionary of Ireland in 1837, it is described to be composed of in the in 1837, 6,121 statue acres as applauded under the Tide Act and 
furnishes limestone flags on potter's clay, iron ore, and slate bits to make pencil. It was also detailed that it had a population of 3,468 in 1837, which is in the present had declined to around 6,700. Notably, it was described as a market and post town, which refers to the fact it contains a post office and a weekly market, which at the time of 1837 would have been a great use for the surrounding population. The area has many fine ancient ring forts, town houses, and castles to support its local history. That's very interesting, Chloe, and thank you very much for that wonderful research using the 1837 Samuel Lewis Topographical Dictionary, which was freely available online through Ask about Ireland and so on, and also in Library Ireland. So there's many sources for the sources we use for researching in the genealogy radio show. And what's next? Are we talking about the transportation of Red Kelly? Yeah, so Ned Kelly's roots come from his father, jo uh, John Kelly, who was transported to Australia for stealing two pigs. and when we say transported that is what we mean by that is penal transportation which was the relocation of convicted criminals to a distant place often a colony or a speci specified term when pit prisoners finish their sentences they are uh, you know, often like they're allowed to go back home or they can stay and move into the colony that they've been moved to and the two big colonies that people were moved to were america and Australia. Um, John Kelly, who was transported, evidently chose to stay in Australia, but did he really have a choice? To return back home would require that he would have enough money for the fare, which would have been challenging for someone just out of jail at, um, and, like, you know, has no money. These would have been around 15 to 20 pounds, which just for inflation would have been about a few thousand pounds today. And a thing to consider is that they probably weren't making that much anyway if he had to steal two pigs. Um, and not many criminals transported would have that kind of money lying around to pay for a ticket back home. Because of having to pay the fee to return home, many penal prisoners like John Kelly chose to stay within the colony. Since most don't come back, transportation was a heavy punishment, but for what crimes was it given out? Well, in John Kelly's case, it was the theft of two pigs, and theft makes up the majority of the crimes of those that were transported. Aside from those convicted of theft, the others were either protesters or criminals that execution was deemed too severe for their crimes. In fact, transportation was often seen as a more humane alternative to execution. Transportation in Ireland ended mostly in 1853, but there was an exception later on with the transportation of those involved in the Fenian Rising in 1867. Transportation ended on, in Australia mainly because of growing protests by colonists who saw it as giving Australia a bad look to potential settlers. And before this, transportation ended in America because of, well, the American Revolution which led to Australia being the main and what and was the main place for where they were sent afterwards. I'll pass it back to you. Thanks very much, Jeff. And that's really interesting. What about John Red Kelly's transportation journey? I think we've got the name of the ship and so on. Or are we are we going to speak about place? Is it Victor? As, yeah, um, I could discuss a bit about Ned Kelly's life as a uh, butch ranger if you're thinking about that at the moment. Yes, but we, we're also talking about our place of transportation. So, Kian, oh, yes. are, you, are you talked about the Van Diemen's Land, Kian? Uh, of course. The, uh, Van Diemen's Land was where uh, Ned Kelly arrived at uh, Hubbard Town, Van Diemen's Land, on its uh, 2nd of January. 1842 aboard the Prince Regent. After finishing his sentence in January 1848, Red Kelly moved to Victoria and found work at James Quinn's farm as Wallen as a bush carpenter. On 18th of November 1850, 
where Kelly married Ellen Quinn, his employer's 18-year-old daughter, at St. Francis Church. Father Jared Ward, at St. Francis Church, Father Jared Ward Associating. The couple subsequently turned their attention to gold digging and earned enough to buy a small freehold in Beveridge, just north of Melbourne. The place he landed, though, the southern was the southern Australian island colony of Van Diemen's Land, as it was known for uh, by for 16, 1642 to 1855. It's merely known as the Commonwealth, uh, Commonwealth State of Tasmania now. The island was discovered by Europeans in 1642 and named after Anthony Van Diemen, the Governor General of the Dutch East, East Indies. Abel J. Tasman, a famous navigator under Van Diemen's command, was the first European to see it. The first British inhabitants kept the name in the, in the early 19th century. Van Diemen's Land became a, an independent a colony in 1825 after being a component of the territory of New South Wales since 1803. The colonists' aggressive, belligerent efforts to increase their dominance of the of island resulted in a long-running struggle, the Black War of 18, 1804 to 1830, that pitted settlers and British soldiers against ta the Tasmanian Aboriginal people, nearly resulting in their, ex their extinction. During the years of 1855 to 1856, the island became self-governing. The long-awaited name change to Tasmania went hand-in-hand -in -hand with its development. Since then, Van Diemen's land has been associated with the horrors of incarceration and ethnic warfare. I'll pass it back to you. That's great, Kian. Thank you for that. And it's really important to know the place that he came from and he went, you know, he made another journey. So it's a two stage journey. And we're going on to Victor now, who's just going to talk about, you know, we've talked about his ancestry of John Red Kelly and we've learned that he married and so on to Ellen Quinn. So, Victor, tell us the rest of the story. Of course. So, Ned Kelly is famous for being an Australian bushranger, but what is a bushranger? A bush ranger was a bandit in the 18th to 19th century Australian outback who robbed stagecoaches, small settlers, abor aboriginals, and miners. Um, bush rangers were originally escaped convicts in the early years of the British settlement of Australia who used the bush as a refuge to hide from the authorities. By the 1820s, the, ther the term had evolved to refer to those who took up robbery under arms as a way of life, using the bush as their base. The number of bush rangers declined due to better policing and improvements in rail transport and communication technology, such as uh, telephones. Although bush rangers appeared sporadically in the early 20th century, most historians regard Kelly's capture and execution in 1880 as effectively re representing the end of bush ranging era. Other famous Bush Rangers include Dan Morgan, who had the nickname Mad Dog. The reason Daniel Morgan was called Mad Dog was because of his erratic nature of killing. For example, he killed a policeman merely for saying hello. So what's interesting about Bush Rangers is their fame and glorification in Australian cultures. Many films have come out with Bush Rangers as a topic. Some films include Stingery, a 1934 film based on the novel with the same name. Bush Ranger films had been so popular in the early 20th century that a ban was implemented in 1911. This ban prevented films from having a negative influence on the Australian population. This ban ended in 1930. So why did these characters like Ned Kelly and Marin Cash, another famous Bush Ranger, uh, famed for his gentleman-like behavior, so why did they become like mythical-like creatures and inspire stories for generations after? The behavior comes from the whole appeal of rebellion rebellion against social norms and society as a whole. Stories with criminals as the protagonists have been popular since known history. For example, Robin Hood, which Ned Kelly is actually sometimes compared to, the Australian version. So Ned Kelly's first run-ins with bush ranging started in 1869 at the age of 14. Kelly met fellow Irish-born Harry Power, who, that was his alias, his real name was Henry Johnson who was a transported convict who turned to bushranging in northeastern Victoria after escaping Melbourne's Pentridge prison. The Kellys formed part of his network of uh, sympathizers, and by May 1869, Ned had become his bushranging protege. 
At the end of the month, they attempted to steal horses from the Mansfield Point property of squatter John Rowe as part of a plan to rob the Woods Point Mansfield Gold Escort. They abandoned the idea and fled back into the bush after John Rowe shot at them, and Kelly temporarily broke off his association with power. Kelly's first brush with the law occurred in mid-October in 1869 over an altercation between him and a Chinese pig and fowl dealer. According to the Chinese man, he passed the Kelly family home and Ned brandished a long stick and declared himself a bush ranger before robbing him of 10 shillings. Kelly gave evidence in court that the Chinese pig and fowl dealer had abused his sister Annie in a dispute over his request for a drink of water. He then beat Ned with a stick after he came to her sister's defense. Annie and two family-related witnesses corroborated Ned's story and the charges were dismissed. Kelly reconciled with Harry Power again in March 1870, and over the next month, the pair committed a series of armed robberies as police scrambled to find them and identify Harry Power as young accomplice. By the end of April, the press had named Kelly as the culprit, and a few days later, he was captured by the police and confined to Beechworth Gale. He, Kelly faced a court on three separate robbery charges, the first two which were dismissed as none of the victims could positively identify him. On the third charge, the victims also reported, reportedly failed to identify Kelly. But they were in fact refused the chance to identify him by the superintendent at the time. Uh, instead, the superintendent told the magistrate that Kelly fitted the description and asked him to be remanded for trial. He was sent to Melbourne to face court. No evidence was produced in court, however, and he was released after a month. Historians tend to disagree over this episode. Some see it as evidence of police harassment, which Kelly, like Kelly thought or said was happening. Others believe that the Kelly family intimidated witnesses, making them reluctant to give evidence. However, um, another factor in this lack of identification uh, may have been that witnesses had described uh, Powers' accomplice as darker toned. However, police believe this was just Kelly going unwashed. There is no doubt that Ned Kelly was a notorious criminal and he was feared as a thief and murderer across Victoria and beyond. While it is unknown how many supporters Kelly had at the time, a national myth arose over time portraying Kelly as a victim of police harassment and an underdog who had the bravery to stand up to the authorities. He also wrote a letter called Kelly's Ger Geraldary Letter, an 8,000 word document in which he attempted to excuse his actions and make a case for unfair police harassment. Joe Byrne revised the letter in a clearer handwriting after Kelly dictated it to him. The letter was written in 1879 at the time that the Geraldary Bank dropped. Kelly handed the letter to Edward Living, the bank's accountant, and asked him to get it published. However, Living, the accountant, boarded a train and handed the letter over to the police. The letter, despite its rough language and lack of grammar and punctuation, provides a significant insight into Ned Kelly's personality. It details Kelly's account of events leading up to Fitzpatrick's shooting and the gang's murder of police officers at Stringy Bar Creek. The language is colorful at times and the reasons aren't always articulated well, but Kelly's primary premise is that he was always acting in self-defense. His, his dissatisfaction with what he perceived as a lengthy history of a British persecution of the Irish people is also clear. So I hope they give you a bit of insight into Ned Thank Kelly you, and Bush Ranging and just who he was. Thank, Thank you very much. Lauren. Thank you, Victor. That's very interesting. And it's very interesting because it shows that the old stories get replayed in the new countries, you know, that they very much get replicated. And so I think we've really covered a little bit about our antiquity uh, and of sources where we can look at the tithe plotments to see where Ned Kelly's grandfather would have farmed and Griffith's valuation, which provides another source and also Samuel Lewis topographical dictionary. And then more records when you're going and seeing what's happening, even the records of being trans, the, the court being Care and Cashel and that whole area being highly policed. And there always seems to be getting into trouble over 
thefts of pigs or something to do with pigs at the time. So highly prized agricultural produce. That's all for today. Our show is podcast out after four o'clock on a Thursday and repeated on a Sunday. And we really welcome your support and we're the radio show that's keeping you in the loop. Did you ever stop and wonder if you could be related to everyone with your last name? Just think if you're a Lincoln, how you'd be congratulated if Honest Abe were someone you could claim. To clear up any mystery, just check your family history. Genealogy is the name of the game. Now some ancestors you'll find you want to hide. But most of them will fill your heart with pride. Oh, your family tree, your your family family tree, check your genealogy, find who was who and how who came to be. On your family, 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 family tree.